Good morning. So, uh, hi. So I, I am John. I'm John Jameson. I'm from uh, Princeton University. Uh, I am a, a digital accessibility developer, which sounds, if that sounds like a not real title, you're right. It's up to get up. Um, uh, we needed someone to do in-house testing. We, we were sending a lot of things out for uh, outside testing, which is a good thing that you should do, but when you have several thousand websites. <coughs> yeah. Um, so now we send a few things out. But we're also getting these tests back, and they use a lot of very technical language. And because it's, it's university, you have lots of developers all over the place, um, you know, they're all trained, they have no idea what to do with this thing. They get in a spreadsheet and it's talking about ARIA. And they're like, is that a song? Like, um, you know, so we also needed someone that could read these things, uh, have sort of a mentor role, and then actually help people fix it. So I'm, I'm a de tester, developer, mentor, whatever. Uh, and these slides, these slides are at, uh, editorially with an 11. Uh, dot .prince.edu slash gc23. I'll have that in there too. Uh, come on in, there's room. Oh <laughs> so we start here with uh, with this slide. Like all web uh, <laughs> conference slides, we start with Egyptian hieroglyphics. So uh, can anyone read hieroglyphics? I'm disappointed. Not shocked. <laughs> um, a cat eats a bird. <laughs> exactly. So this says uh, Ramses Erphonos, if we uh, translate it. Uh, and if that doesn't make sense to you, you're right. Uh, because there's a typo. <laughs> it turns out, uh, WCAG, let's say version 0.0001 from about 1200 BC, uh, says that the birds are supposed to face in the direction you're supposed to read the line, because you can write hieroglyphics right to left or left to right, and some poor carver carved in stone the name, Ramses, son of Ray, misspelled his boss's name by putting the bird backwards, uh, and had to plaster over it and then carve it again in the right direction. So you were looking at 3,000 year old white out there, and somewhere in the last 3,000 years the plaster fell out, and so the duck has two heads. Uh, so, why do I start here? I start here because the entire history of creating content has been all about blaming the author. Um, we, we've had training, this is a Sumerian Akkadian bilingual lexicon carved in stone. It, it's a dictionary, it's a bilingual dictionary from I think like 2300 BC. Um, so, from the beginning of time, if you want to write, you have to go to school. You go to trainings, um, you have to master this body of knowledge from arcane texts. Uh, and, and proofreading is manual, proofreading is, is, is grueling. Uh, when I was a kid, we were taught to, to, to read backwards the thing we'd written, because you'd start skimming if you were just reading. And, um, and it was error prone. Uh, so, why do I say tilde 1980? Um, because something has changed in our lifetimes, most of our lifetimes. Um, <laughs> Around the 80s, Spellcheck went from this experimental thing that was running on Unix mainframes to something that was coming with office programs uh, on personal computers. Uh, and eventually, somewhere later, people could actually afford them. Um, we've gotten very used to this. It does the spell checking for us. It's not perfect. Um, but what has happened over the last couple of years is increasingly now, when something goes wrong, we blame the tool more than each other. We don't say, sorry boss, I misspelled your name. We say, oh, I'm so sorry, my phone auto-corrected your name to this horrible thing. You know, we blame the tool. This is a huge change. Um, so what about accessibility? You've been to a lot of talks by now, probably. I'm on day two, where people are teaching you all of these arcane texts. Um, I think it has a distinct Sumerian Akkadian vibe to me. Um, you know, when I look at the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Quick Ref, it looks awfully like a Sumerian Akkadian vibe. <laughs> It does. Um, you know, it's my job. I have mastered this body of arcane knowledge. Um, but, you know, we're, we're asking authors to attend a lot of trainings. We're asking them to learn a lot of things. Uh, proofreading is manual. It's error prone. Um, you know, even if you know this, it's still error prone. Uh, and, and when we're going to these trainings, you know, we're telling people, oh, just do this and you're going to do great work. Um, they're not hearing that. They're hearing, hey, do more work. Um, you know, we're all wearing a lot of hats, we're all, we all have a lot of roles. Uh, even someone that, that, you know, has bought into this, is, you know, passionate about accessibility, they still, they were hired to do 17 jobs. And this is an 18th job we're giving them, and then we're not giving them a raise. Um, more work's not a great thing. And, and my job was increasingly emailing people uh, about, you know, missing all text. You know, we spent a lot of time on that website, that's great, but you need to do more work. No one likes it. So, 
Um, and I know, this. so I spent years before this, uh, before this job, I was uh, embedded in our public relations office, I'm supporting the writers directly. Um, I knew they were busy, and I knew that they were presenting extra work, and I knew they would tend to forget tasks that fell outside their role. So even if you get past that point where you've given them more work and, and trained them, um, they're probably not happy about it. Um, and odds are good they're going to they're gonna forget it. Um, maybe not maliciously. Uh, uh, Hanlon's razor was in the last uh, in the keynote talking about, you know, don't, don't attribute to malice. Um, but, you know, you're asking to put more sticky notes on their monitor. Um, so I, I went on a quest. I was like, surely someone is selling an accessibility spell checker. Uh, certainly I can throw money at this problem. I even unblocked the phone number of that salesperson who kept calling me from the large company that you might be able to guess. Um, <coughs> so, first place. So I looked at the manual checkers. I use these all the time. This is a checker called Wave. Um, it's a wonderful tool. I have nothing bad to say about Wave. I use it on a daily basis. Um, doesn't remotely meet this need. Um, you have to be told that they exist. You have to be told to install them. You have to install them. You have to be taught how to read them. I mean, this is this is arcane the first time you see it. Um, you know, once you've learned it, I can, I can see the matrix here. But I, I don't. I, you know, someone is just trying to like tell what time, you know, what day the event is and put it on the department calendar. I don't want to teach them what ARIA role presentation means. Um, and then you have to be reminded to use them. Even if I get to the point that someone's come to the training, I've taught them this. They're busy people, and a week later, they're going to forget to run this. Um, so, and, and most of them. I mean, really target developers. This is Axe, you know, it's, it's checking this page, and the top alert is ARIA hidden element must contain focus, or, ARIA hidden element must contain focusable elements. That's a critical blocker. I don't want my writer to know what that is. I mean, you know, they, they, they don't know what that is, and they can't fix it. Even if they had a side job as a developer, they don't have access to the Git repo. Um, so I, I saw I needed different checks, and it wasn't just fewer checks. If you look, I'm not expecting you to read this slide, it's all small, I'll read it, it doesn't matter. Um, but this, this is all the tests that Axe finds on my um, testing page, uh, you know, and it finds about seven things, and, and, and some of them are content related. Links must have text, headings should be not be empty, headings should only increase by one. Well, a bunch of them, there's ARIA stuff. Um, but if you delete that, you're down to four results. What I wanted was this list. You know, here, those are the same four, but I also wanted, you know, there's a line of bold text on this thing. That's probably a heading. You know, should this be a heading? Um, this image has no alt text. Well, that means it's been marked decorative. As far as Axe is concerned, that passes. You can mark images as decorative. But if my content writer is marking as decorative, I'm suspicious. Um, <laughs> you know, and I want to just say, manual check. Are you sure you meant to do that? Do you know what that does? Um, you know, maybe the alt text, maybe the text term is unpronounceable. Uh, maybe they put in quote marks. Uh, now it passes an automated check, but it's not going to run for the screen reader. This goes on and on. But so it wasn't just that I wanted to knock out the developer test. I wanted a whole different test suite. Um, and I knew it had to be creative. So like I wanted to start flagging click here links. Uh, you know, I write a lot of emails saying, please stop making your link click here. But you can't just make a list of bad links, because if you do, you're going to find, once you start studying this, that you have to have click here, you have to have here, you have to have learn more, you have to have more, you have to have click here to learn more, you have to have click this link to learn more, you have to have link this link, this link to learn more. You know, you've got a polymorphation whatever problem. Um, so, so, you know, someone had to spend their time and homework figuring out how to write these tests. So, and I started looking at the enterprise crawlers. Um, uh, this is actually DubBot. We, there was a talk yesterday. You can, uh, if you were there, you can hit the recording. Um, uh, and I saw some stuff I love. They had some great checks, but they had that same problem. You had to be told it existed. You know, hey everyone, we have an enterprise license for this. Uh, you have to be taught how to use it because this is this is. Um, I was very pleased with this. I thought this was one of the most intuitive interfaces I'd found. Um, but that doesn't mean it was intuitive. You know, you got to come to a training. Uh, I need to be reminded to use it. I know if we set someone up in DubBot they're going to work on their broken links for about a week and think this is really cool, and then they're never going to log in again. You know, so now you, need, you need to be hounding them. Um, not a bad thing. We have, I think, a thousand sites at DubBot like we're taking this seriously, but it doesn't meet that need for the content writer. It's for the site owner. Um, and I was really afraid of more work. Uh, most of the tools I looked at um, had really complicated user interfaces. Um, they had role-relevant alerts. Uh, maybe not, you know, ARIA hidden, um, but like, you know, the, the links are, you know, this, this is saying that the, uh, the there's not enough color contrast between the link and the text around it, you know, well, it depends on the person whether they can fix that. They probably can't. Um, you know, that's a role-relevant alert. Right? So I didn't want to, eh. um, a lot of them had really lengthy workflows. 
Um, you know, if you click, why is this an issue? You have to now step through this workflow where you have to argue with the tool to like convince it that you really want to ignore this. I didn't want that for a writer. Um, CK Editor Accessibility Checker. This is a Drupal module um, for CK4. It came really close. Uh, we were actually running this in Drupal 7, um, and it was really what I was imagining. I mean, it was a simple checker. It doesn't use the word WCAG in a sentence. Um, it's focusing on content. Um, but you had to click the button to check your work. No one ever clicked that button. You had to be told it was there. You didn't even know it was there. You're looking for bold and italic. Let me tell you, banner blindness. No one knew that was there unless I pointed to it and said, that's an accessibility checker. Um, you, you didn't really have to be taught to use it. It's pretty straightforward. But you had to be reminded. No one was ever going to notice. Um, it was close. Uh, after about 30 tools, there was one that, that, that really stood out. Um, and this was called Sally. Uh, and this is a pet project by Adam Chabrick at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, he had forked um, a manual checker uh, and made it s automatic. So you would install this um, as part of your theme on the front end. Uh, and for logged in users, it would show up as a little checker toggle, like the, um, like the accessibility checker toggle in the corner. And if you were to open it, you know, then every time you were opening a page, it would be running and checking. Um, then you can close it the other way. But very simple tips. Um, this was really what I was looking for. Now, if you ask two developers, you get three opinions. So I had like a whole bunch of things I wanted to change, of course. Um, so I went to my boss and said, I think I found something. I think I can make it work for us. Um, could I have a inappropriate amount of time to fork it? Um, and uh, and she was like, by all means. Um, and so I wanted to, 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 uh, I wanted to automate the decision of whether that panel was going to fly open or not based on what it found. I didn't want you to turn it on and off. Um, so I wanted to change how it worked under the hood. Um, I had a bunch of other things and optimizations. And I gave a dev talk yesterday, if you're curious about some of that stuff. But forget it, not for this talk. Um, and I wanted to make a turnkey Drupal module. Uh, Sally uh, was a JavaScript library. And one of the things that irritates me about Drupal is that we're like, it's easy. Just you know, adapt this library and put it in your composer install file and bring it in and then edit your theme to install this library and attach it to your hooks. No, I wanted people to press the install button on the module and have an accessibility checker. Um, so many months later, <clears throat> uh, there was V1, and then like a year or two later, there was V2. And, um, and, and, and this is what it looks like today. So my checker, it, it starts as a toggle. Um, you load a page, there's going to be a little floaty toggle in the corner. It's no longer an accessibility icon, because thanks to accessibility, that is a bad icon now. Um, but it's a little check mark to say, good job, or, or, or a count of issues it's found. And it, 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 it might have like a red outline circle or a yellow solid circle, depending on how bad it thinks the issues are. Uh, if it detects something bad, it's going to automatically pop open. You can click to open it or close it yourself. But it's going to auto pop if it detects a new issue since you last looked at the page. So if you may, if this is your fault, if you save the page, it's going to automatically pop open. It's going to highlight the issue um, and, and, and poke you with a stick, so to say. Uh, uh, and then it's going to explain um, the issues. And it's quite verbose. Uh, in version 1, Sally had these really short tips. Adam likes really short tips. I did the same in, in version 1. And then I linked to more information. Guess who never clicks links? Everyone! Um, so for version 2, I, I tried to shove like the minimum viable training into every tip, uh, where it sort of explains what a heading is and why it matters. And it has to be really compact, because I really can only fit that much. So it's not like this replaces the training, but it really helps. Um, so let's do a little, just so you can picture this better. All right, so in practice. So here we go. So this, this is a page. You've just loaded this page. There's a little toggle in the corner. I'm going to click the toggle. It flies open that little panel, and I see, oh, there's a little thing here. What's that? And I can do that. And it, it pops open a tip, and it says, you know, manual check, possible redundant text in all. That's the yellow. Yellow, this is a manual check. So this means I, I as a developer, I'm not confident this is a problem. Um, so I, I say, you know, this image is alt text is placeholder image. Uh, screen readers announce they're describing an image when it goes on from there. But, but it, it's saying, you know, placeholder image is awfully suspicious for an alt text. Are you really sure that's what you want? 
Um, uh, and it has some some uh, buttons here. These are optional uh, as to who which who gets to use those. But I can say hide this alert for me. Don't bother me. This isn't my problem. Um, or if I have the right permissions, I can say mark OK for all users, and that's going to store a little information about what page I'm on and probably the URL of the image. It's going to store a little snippet, so the next time this runs, um, it'll it'll hide that. And that actually I'll show that. Um, if I do that and reload the page, um, it's going to start out. It's going to say that there's there's a hidden alert on this page. Um, and so I, I can bring that back if I want, but the count goes down. Um, now it also has that, it says there's one issue detected still that I don't see here. So I can say, you know, next, and it'll scroll me down and find the thing. And, and here's another manual check. So it's saying, is, is this link document accessible? This is the most divisive test of the whole suite. There are ways in the config panel where you can disable this test. It's very polarizing. Some people are very excited to hear, some people hate it. Um, but it just basically says, you know, hey, I see you're linking to a PDF. Is that an accessible PDF? Do you know what an accessible PDF is? Um, that sort of thing. So, so some manual checks. Uh, if I edit the page, uh, come on, here we go. Let's do. Let's make a real nice table, a real nice table with no headings, uh, because that's the default. Uh, hi, uh, and we're gonna save. Now, it's not checking any of the stuff in there. No, it, it, so this, this runs on the front end, uh, and it just popped open. So, this, so it's, it's set to automatically annoy you if you do something bad. Uh, normally, it would just be that little corner toggle, and I can say first, there's that link document, and now I have a red alert. There's no manual check. You cannot dismiss this. Um, you know, this is bad. Uh, and so it says this is an error. Here, you gotta fix this. Now, if you're the site administrator, there is a way you can ignore this from the admin console, but the writer doesn't get to decide that they're gonna not put table headers on the table. Would this run on preview instead of save? Yeah. Or yeah, anytime you're rendering your front end feed, this will run. Um, what I haven't played with yet, but I think it will work, is that there's that uh, phase two has this new like live preview thing where they have like an iframe parallel to what you're editing that's continuously refreshing. I haven't tested it yet, but I'm pretty sure it would even work there. Um, if it doesn't, I'll make it work. <laughs> well, what was the reason for not having it on the editor? Uh, and is there another tool? Or do, you, do you know of a tool that does it that way instead? Um, in my last slide, I really hope I'm going to do that someday. Um, <laughs> I don't in CK Editor 5. Okay. Um, the, the CK4 checker was based on an abandoned JavaScript library, and no one's written one yet for 5. Uh, if my manager gives me another bucket of time, I'm going to do it. But, um, but the other reason that I do it this way is because Drupal assembles parts. Um, and so I want to check the rendered content in Drupal. Um, when I edited this page, there was like 55 fields all over the place. And if I'm going to be checking like the heading nesting order, and you're using Layout Builder and paragraphs and all this stuff, I cannot check that until Drupal assembles it. Um, so I think I do the most good here. Um, which is why I tackled this problem first. So, uh, and then it phones home. So there are, um, in the, the site uh, reports tab for admins, there's, there's a dashboard here where it'll show you, um, you know, top issues, which pages have the most issues, the most recent issues, um, the most recent dismissals, uh, and I can actually, uh, as the site admin, I can say, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I can restore that alert. Um, yeah. So, all right, back to the slides. Let's get back to the. All right. Um, and I feel like after, you know, I do this whole talk and like my demo is about four minutes, but that's the point. You know, the more work I do, there's less to show. It's supposed to be simple. Um, Lesson learned. I learned a lot of lessons. Um, lesson one, you know, set aside time to configure. I wanted this to be turnkey. Um, and I really succeeded in my opinion. Like if you turn this on on your site, it's probably going to work. Um, but uh, you might be getting false positives. You might be getting role irrelevant alerts. 
so there's some, there's some config in there where you can you can constrain it to say you know these are the parts of the page our content editors can actually edit. Um, don't give them alerts in the menu. Don't give them alerts in the footer. Uh, that kind of thing. You can sell to skip over elements within that area. So if you have a social media embedded widget or a calendar widget, if you have widgets that are throwing alerts that they can't fix, um, doesn't mean you shouldn't fix them, but there's no reason that they should be getting flagged for things they can't fix. Um, so you can you can map those out. Um, there's a bunch of other settings you can you can play with to to um, not even show it for certain users. Um, you can that that documents test. There's a way to disable it. Uh, there's a couple of permissions it creates, so you can tune who actually is going to see the checker at all. I mean, maybe you have people that just are like, for viewers for your site that you don't want to uh, um, be seeing these things. You can control who can mark something as okay. You can control who can view the reports, that sort of thing. What do you think about that? Um, and if you happen to be a developer or you know, employ a developer, uh, there's a whole bunch of JavaScript events within the library uh, that you can play with. And the one that is of most interest to most people is that there's a config option to say uh, the theme JavaScript is going to handle revealing hidden tooltips inside these containers. Which is a funny way of saying I have an accordion or I have a tab panel or I have like a carousel. Uh, and if you have an issue inside a hidden tab, um, the user's not going to be able to find it. And so there's a fallback behavior editorially by default. It's going to see when it inserts a tip if it thinks it's visible. If it thinks it isn't, it's going to kind of walk up through the HTML to find something that isn't visible, then just draw a big outline around it and say, I think your alert's in here, good luck. Um, <laughs> it's not a deal. It's better than nothing. It's turnkey. Curly. But this, if you've set this, then when it detects that um, it's sticking a tip inside one of these containers, it's going to throw an event saying, show hidden. Uh, and I'm trying to insert uh, a button that has this ID, uh, and the rest is your problem. And Penn State, I love this example, because they, they were so proud of this, it turns out their developers have sort of a style guide, and so whenever they're creating an interactive component, they always use the same event in the component to activate it. And so they, it took them four lines of code to say, you know, if Edley Show Hidden is fired, go get the data, the, the whatever has a data interactive component attribute that is around that thing, and fire its activate event. And whatever it is, because they wrote their code so cleanly, that switches to that tab or switches to that slide or opens that accordion. Um, I can tell you our code for our theme is much more complicated because uh, I have to have a separate thing for the accordion, and the slide, and the tab. But still, it, it's there if you have a developer. And then that just makes it much more seamless. You know, you hit next in the panel because you don't see where the tip is, and it switches which tab is open and scrolls to it. Um, so that, that kind of thing makes it much more useful. Lesson two. Lesson two is that making accessible content is hard because we made it hard. We made our tools before accessibility was a thing, and we haven't rewritten our tools yet. So if you look at the typical CK Editor toolbar, uh, you know it can be summarized as bad, bad, good, bad, 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 manual and complicated. You know, there's you know, the option of like have strike through text. Um, strike through text at the moment isn't read by screen readers. So if you say, you know, our talk is at 10.15 and cross it out and say 9.15, the screen reader is going to say our talk is at 10.15, 9.15. You know, they're going to miss your talk. Um, so it's bad. Underlines are bad. Um, left to line text. Hey, that's good. Um, but why do you need that option? Because every other alignment is bad. Is it always bad? No, it's not bad. If you're a designer, you can make a template where you center some text judiciously and prudently. Should your content writer be doing that? Probably not. I mean, maybe you in the styles drop down, or maybe you have a component, or which maybe you have something that has center text, but you don't necessarily want to give them the option. Um, you know, bullets and numbers are manual, media is complicated. So simplification is better than validation. You know, wherever possible, just get rid of something if you can. Um, provide pre designed style pickers, template components. That's that's I'd rather editorially doesn't fire than that you're so happy that your checker found something, you know? Um, another thing I found is that requiring without teaching needs to work around. Mm. So Drupal requires alternative text. It has this nice description that no one reads that explains what alternative text is. Uh, and then you try to go on without filling out. It says, please fill out this field. And they're like, mm, space, placeholder image, uh, quote mark. Um, maybe they've been to a class. I found so many quote marks, and I said, "What is going on on one of our sites?" 
And I had to finally just call up the writers, like, why are you putting all these quote marks? And they said, well, we came to your accessibility class, and you said you could put an empty alt in to mark an image as decorative, and that that's just two quote marks. And so they thought that's what they were supposed to do, so they were putting two quote marks in, and so it was outputting four quote marks, and so the screen reader was, it was not marked decorative, it had an unpronounceable alt. Right. Teaching, without requiring, leads to learning. So uh, the decorative image, which are coming out of these discussions, one, uh, another developer in my group actually built this module. It's called Decorative Image Widget, and it it um, adds this decorative button. So if you want, you can mark check. You can just check off that the alternative. Now the alternative text is optional if you check that checkbox. But it's very threatening. This image is decorative and should be hidden from screen readers. If you've never been to a class, that's a little scary. It implies you should know what you're doing. Um, does that mean people are not misusing it? No. But it encourages learning and it discourages workarounds. Um, you know, because there's a little checkbox there for people. So affirmation, teaching, try to think about reversing that, that flow. Uh, and a couple of lessons I've learned but I haven't done anything about yet. Um, uh, very much on my wish list because I find it infuriating. Is that CK editor still in CK5? If you insert a table, it inserts a table with no headers. It is a power user function to know how to add headers to a table. You have to be told they exist, you have to be taught how to do it, and you have to remember to do it. There is no reason they can't just have a header row on insert, and if you don't want that because you wanted a header column, you're going to see that you need to do something. There's no told, taught, reminded. You're going to be like, oh, that's not what I want. You'll right click and change it to a header column. Um, so like, if we change the default, now you're putting the onus on people who want to be inaccessible to have to know how to turn off the header, rather than having to tell people that they should have headers. I really hope to attack this. Um, heading suggestions, this is something I want to do for a long time. There was an initiative for CK4 that had something where they were working on this, but it, it, it Never really landed. Um, but anyway, when you're inserting a heading, I would love it if the interface uh, steered you in the right direction as to you probably want a heading two or a heading three. Um, now, I don't want to forbid stuff because you could be using CK Editor in any field. I mean, you really could be a layout builder and heading four might be the right choice. As soon as you have one, I mean, if you have a heading two in CK Editor and you're doing something, I know that you want a two or three. Um, but for that first heading in that box, I don't really actually know from within CK Editor what the right answer is. But if we had some way of sort of subtly discouraging or guiding, I think they would do a lot of the sort of telling. You know, you'd still need the teaching and reminding, but like it would at least sort of raise the question, of why is this steering me this way? Um, that kind of thing. On my wish list is as you type checking. Um, I have a proof of concept in WordPress, in my WordPress port. Um, where as you are typing, it will highlight issues. It does not have like the tips and the dismissal workflow. It's not full featured. One of the big challenges here is finding the balance between helpful and annoying. Um, I spent a lot of time on that on the front end. The bar is a lot higher uh, for not being annoying if you're like producing spell check for real. But it's proof of concept. It's possible. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to explore that. Um, which would be cool. I couldn't run all the checks. It's not rendered content. You know, the heading order check is not going to work right. You know, I have to disable certain checks. But, you know, some things could be nice. All right, lesson three. Lesson three. Change is most likely when feedback is immediate and role relevant. This is a screenshot um, from the revisions log that I took because I was so excited when I saw this. Uh, and at 9.50 a.m. on October 17th, someone saved that node with fake headings. And at 9.51, they did something. And at 9.52, they did something again. And this time, there were no fake headings. And so I know that editorially attacked them. And it took them two tries to get it right. But within 120 seconds, that node had headings. If I had emailed them you know, the next week, it either would have never been fixed, or it might have been fixed, maybe it would be fixed later. Like, now it's work. It's more work. But because they were in their flow of writing, they get saved because they wanted to review and preview their content, and they said, oops, I didn't put heading in. They that is what you want. Boy, does that mean told talk and running. All right, so I went from sending to receiving. I was sending lots and lots of emails. I'm still sending lots of emails. I'm saying I'm not sending lots of emails, but they're different now. Um, so I went from being, you know, saying, hey, you need headings, to 
seeing responses, seeing emails, seeing slacks, things like, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you, editorially found this issue, and like, what do I do with it? And, oh, that's a table. Oh, well, editorially flagged it, or my accessibility checker wants me to put alt text on, or accessibilities, interesting spelling, um, does not want me to build it with tables. That wasn't me, that wasn't an email. That was you saying that accessibility checker is yelling at me. What do I do? Um, you know, oh, quick question for you, John. You know, this flag, this, what am I supposed to do? Oh, I noticed. That I save these because they make my performance reviews really easy to write. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's like I spent all this time thinking, here I am, like spending six months on this rabbit trail and like what a waste of the university's money. But now it's doing the part of my job that sucks for me. And my boss is delighted because the job's getting done. And she would much rather be paying me to write JavaScript than paying me to email people. Uh, and they're happier because it's, what was that previous slide? Immediate. It's immediate and role relevant. It doesn't feel like no work. So. So, does that replace the rest of our Q&A initiatives? Not at all! I said we have a thousand sites in Dubbot. I do man, I do man in the test about 80 sites a year. Um, I'm doing all these things. Um, but that's only really reaching a sliver of our world. We have thousands of university websites. Um, but between Drupal and WordPress, um, I think 1,500 websites are, are, are having at least that one layer of defense. Um, and, and then it drives people into trainings. Like people show up in the trainings and they're like, I'm here because I keep getting attacked by your checker and I want to know more. And I'm like, great, I've never heard of you. You know, it's like they're having how do you want to recruit. So everything else relies on told, taught, and reminded. So your takeaway, don't rely on told, taught, reminded. If you give people tools that fit how they work, they will give you better work instead of giving you more work. And that's all I have to say about it. Yes. Does it have any capacity to do like a decoupled site? Is there any way to have it point the front end of you know a non-Drupal page to report back to Drupal? Is it Not turnkey. Um, it certainly could. So at, at, under the hood, there's a JavaScript library. You don't need the Drupal module to run the checker. That JavaScript library throws those events. You can run that. Um, you can hook the event for um, results already, and then do anything you want. So all of my so my Drupal module and the JavaScript library are two different things. And so the what the JavaScript library is doing is it's just doing its thing. It just checks the page and then it says, yeah, results are ready, and it goes back to sleep. The Drupal module has its own JavaScript that when it hears results are ready, it grabs Drupal's boilerplate for how you send things to the JSON API and it grabs a copy of that results array and fires it at Drupal. And then the Drupal module does other stuff. So talk to me, like you could basically look, you could, if you looked at the hood in my code and looked at that JavaScript, you could point that anywhere. So you would have to, in a decoupled environment, run the checker yourself, and you would have to figure out how you're gonna, you know, however it is that you're checking from your decoupled site to Drupal to send stuff, um, you could send stuff to my API, and as far as it would know, it was the module itself, like it wouldn't know the difference. So it could be done, I can't make that turnkey, because every decoupled site's different. different. So. Yes? Uh, when you install the module on an existing site with lots of content, yes. how does it start collecting and reporting on that? Does it scan everything? Is it when you visit pages as people in the role that the scanner should run? How? It's, it, it, it checks as an editor views a page. Um, so it, it, it works best on new sites. If it's an old site, uh, what I basically recommend is, because since you have to look around anyway to look for false positives and configure it, as you are exploring the site as a developer, you're actually checking those pages as you go. So if you click all the main menu pages, that's going to get those. If you have a deep news library or something, it can be a little weird. Like we were running this on our, the main university site, and I wrote it you know, 10 years after the first news story. So every so often it gets a recent detection on the news story from like 2008. So um, I have thought of ways I could write a crawler, but I haven't written a crawler. But fundamentally, I would say click, click through all the pages in your menu, and that will seed it with the stuff that matters. Um, thank you. Yeah. So our, our website, we, we, we have thousands of like PDF files and Excel files, yep. all files, but we use LaserFish as a document management system. Right. So when you have that, you have, you're attaching a file. Like, I don't, I'm a content person, so I don't right, know right, the right. stuff. Would it still flag that the way the document management system is talking to Drupal? Yeah, the default config, 
out of the box is just looking at the URL of the links and looking for like .pdf okay. or something like that, um, which you could modify in any way. So, okay. if you knew that you were, <laughs> if you knew you had a robust PDF program, you might actually disable that test because it gets in the way. But otherwise, it's just it's not even saying this is an accessible. It has no way because it's running in right. the browser. There's no way of knowing if the PDF is good or bad. Right. So it's really just poking the person and saying, did you did you go to an accessibility class or should you stop using PDFs? <laughs> <laughs> Um, how does it handle iframe content? It can't. Um, because JavaScript uh, iframes are not porous, so it cannot see through that wall. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to follow up on the if, uh, document question, yeah. if you're using media and your links are media URLs that rabbit hole into uh, PDF for the public view or something like that, how would it be able to do that check? Uh, I... Or can it? It can, I think. <laughs> I'm just curious to know if I, if that is, if the user interface, um, Yeah, the um, I got to look in the source. So it is doing a selection pattern for on the URL okay. uh, for like PDF. I think, although I'm not sure, that out of the box it might also be looking for like slash documents or something. Uh, but whatever it is, whatever your pattern is, like in theory, yeah, because there's configuration override that you could say like if the URL is like slash doc or slash document or slash media, wherever it is that yours is your file system path. You could you can you can override that test and, and educate it. I think it does out of the box because I think it flags on our sites and we do that. I just don't remember because I wrote that three years ago. Uh, gonna... Yeah, um, I'm curious about the decorative image module thing. Mm -hmm. Do you find that now instead of adding quotes, people just click the button and move on so that they don't have to enter alt text? Because we constantly struggle with this thing of like. Is it better to make it required and have garbage on decorative images versus, you know, all of that I'm sure you're familiar with? And I worry that if we did that, it would just give people a way out. You know? Well, and the funny thing is, I'm editorial then flags it. Oh, yeah. Because they well, can't yeah, talk to so each other. So if you mark yes, decorative, yes, you say right, right. editorial is going to like, did you right. really mean to mark that decorative? Right. Or does this have meaning in context? Mm -hmm. um, it's a lose lose. I don't have a right no, or wrong right. answer there. If people want to work around it, they're going to work around it. Make people care more. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. well I mean, that's, I that's guess what I'm trying to do. Like, I'm trying because I'm not saying like you know leave the alt blank. I'm saying mark this decorative. Like, I'm making them check a box that says people who use screen readers should not be able to know what this image is. So I feel like that's as far as I can go towards trying to make people care. Right, but I guess my question is, have you experienced that happening? Either sense. Not much. Okay. Um, most our people care enough. Um, yeah. I mean, you're right that it, it it's it's that one that works in combination with the checker, right? The right. two things are like a check and balance against each other. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. where we have the most issues is images of text. Right. And I have Adam Chabrick and I both are constantly staring at. There's a, a tesseract.js. There's a JS library to do optical character recognition, and we both and we both keep staring at this and trying to figure out how to to, to like create an OCR test that, uh, yeah, that yells at you, but it's a huge lift. So neither of us have done it yet, but we so often start texting about it. Yeah? You mentioned that you need the accessibility training, so I'm interested to find out, like, is there a cadence that you have people re-educate themselves? Or like, how do you keep people on top of being accessible other than just having the module? <sighs> That's not a good thing. I, so fortunately, we hired another trainer, so I'm mostly training developers now. Um, we have an intro class. We have um, a pretty robust CPAC, there's a certified professional in accessibility core competencies from the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, I think. Um, so we, we encourage people to take that, and if they do um, get that certification, then you have professional development hours. And so then we have an annual workshop we do that gets the most of their professional development. So for the people that we care about most, we try to do that to get their regular games. For everyone else, our, our, our um, crawler um, initiative, you know, we're using that bot, but like whatever the crawler is, 
we're still rolling it out. We've gotten one or two hundred people in. We hope to get more than a thousand in. It's going to take years. My dream for this, and it's far down the road, is that once we have most of these people onboarded, then like once a year, we'll sit down, we'll get the Dubbot backend folks to send us a spreadsheet of who hasn't logged in in a year. Mm -hmm. um, we'll look at the trend for information for which sites are getting worse, and then we will prioritize reaching out to people that haven't logged in, in the last year or their sites are going downhill, and this will become kind of just an ongoing cadence. That is currently pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're just kind of in the initial rollout and sort of, because um, we just did the initial crawl, we just handed them a CSV of like, please crawl these thousand sites. And so with that, we can now look at like who's worst. So we can sort of prioritize the people that are worst or the people who are highest priority, but it's going to take us years to get everyone on board. That's great. Thank you. I'm sure we're out of overtime. So. Yeah, it's time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.